I want to share with all of you this morning something of a mystery, something of a mystery that we find even in the Gospels, and the whole sermon is about that term tetelestai, tetelestai. You know what that means? It is finished, tetelestai. And there's a couple of passages to turn your attention to right in the beginning, and then there's a number of other passages that I will hit on as we go through. So won't you turn to John 17? John 17 is also known as the high priestly prayer of our Lord. Before we read that, let me pray, and then we get into the passages. Lord, we thank you for a day like this. We thank you for this glorious mystery, this mystery of godliness in Jesus Christ our Lord, the fact that we can be found in him this morning, and the fact that this reality is a finished work, a finished reality. Even the fact that we are here this morning adds nothing to that glorious work of what you accomplished for us at the cross, having sat down now at the right hand of the Father. You have finished this work, yet there is still this finished work that we are part of. And there is still a finished aspect that we await for in regard to the redemption of our bodies, the end of all things, and the new heaven and the new earth, where you will reign supreme, where there will be no more sin. So, Lord, we recognize the mystery of this. Recognize that even by faith, we are part of this finished, redeemed work of our Lord. We do pray, Lord, that we would not take these things for granted as your people. That we would not take this finished work as a reason for us to take a foot off of the pedal in regard to serving you but rather we would be rigorous and we would be filled with much of a zeal for your glory. Help us in this, O Lord. We pray that even if you are pleased, that you would fill us up, even by next year's Good Friday service, that our chairs would be full as we seek to worship you every day because of what you have done in this finished work at the cross. So, work in us, O Lord. We commit ourselves to you. We pray that your Holy Spirit would speak, that you would have free reign amongst us, that you would give unction to the preaching of your word, that you would have me say that which you would have me say. Lord, we do prepare, we do study to show ourselves approved, but we do know that you're the one that speaks through your word. And so we pray, O Spirit of God, that you would illuminate the truth to us, that our minds would also be ready and ready to receive from you the food of your word, the drink of your word, that you would make our souls thirsty for righteousness, and that we would take in you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Verse 1 to 5. Jesus spoke these things and lifted up his eyes to heaven. He said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on the earth, having finished the work which you have given me to do. Let me read that last part again. I have glorified you on the earth, having finished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Turn then to John 18, looking at verse 10 to 11. As they come to arrest our Lord, Peter, having a sword, draws it. You remember part of what happened there, but listen to what John's account is of this. John 18, verse 10 to 11. Simon Peter then, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear, and the slave's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put the sword into the sheath. The cup which the Father has 
given me, shall I not drink it? Look then at John 19, verse 28 to 30. You'll see something of the theme of tetelestai as we go through these passages. John 19, 28 to 30. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been finished, already been tetelestai, in order to finish, in order to complete or tetelestai the scriptures, said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. Tetelestai. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Look with me a little bit later in John 20, verse 30 to 31. Here John gives us the reason for why he has written the gospel, why he has given us all that we've read before and also the whole of the book of of John. Therefore, many other signs, this is John 20, verse 30 to 31, therefore many other signs Jesus also did in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. We're going to be looking at this sermon in four parts, looking at this idea of tetelestai, because this is the very reason why we have eternal life. We enter into that finished work. It is already done. There is nothing we can add to this. There is nothing we can subtract from this. It is finished. And the real way that Christians live is by faith in the finished work of Christ. That actually fills you and I with great vigor to run the race that Jesus has before us. This work is a finished work. There's a mystery to this because even before the foundation of the world, Christ died for sinners. It has always been by faith in Christ, through the grace of God, to the glory of God, by the Scriptures. All that we have is already finished. It's already done. It's already dusted. You are positionally right now as a saved individual in Christ, seated with Him at where, where Christ is, at the right hand of the Father. It is finished. All of this is done. So let's look at the finished work of redemption. That's the first section that we look at, the finished work of redemption, if you're taking notes. In John 17, verse 4, which we read, Jesus, lifting up his eyes to heaven, declares, I glorified you on the earth, having finished. It's already been done. He hasn't even yet gone to the cross. But it's already finished. I've finished the work which you have given me to do, Father. This profound statement echoes his ultimate proclamation that comes later at the cross, where he says, Tetelestai. He just says, finished, finished, finished. There's still, brothers and sisters, a finished aspect of what we hope for, this final redemption of our bodies, the reign of Christ, the fact that all his enemies will be made as a footstool under his feet. It is as good as already done. It is finished. This is the faith that we have. Yet Jesus affirms the completion of that task that was entrusted to him by the Father. This work, as outlined throughout the Scriptures, encompasses this grand narrative of redemption that is woven throughout the Old Testament and the prophets and the Psalms. It is the fullness of God's promise to reconcile humanity to himself. It's done. It's finished. He also demonstrates the boundless love of God. He is the provided means for salvation. And through his sacrificial death on the cross, Jesus fulfills every single prophecy that has been written about him, becoming that ultimate atoning sacrifice for sin. 
Now, the whole of the New Testament further affirms the finality as well as the sufficiency of Christ's redemptive work. In Hebrews 10, verse 12, it declares that Jesus, after offering himself as a sacrifice for sins, sat down at the right hand of God. That whole act, that whole symbolism of sitting down at the right hand of the Father shows the completion of that atoning work, a work of ultimate authority and triumph over sin and over death. But in its essence, this concept of tetelestai encapsulates the culmination of Christ's earthly mission and the fulfillment of God's plan of redemption. But even here, in his high priestly prayer, before he's even betrayed by Judas, Jesus says, it's finished. It's as good as done. I'm so committed to this. There's nothing that would stop me. Hence, when Peter takes out the sword, he says, my father's already given this cup to me. Shall I not drink it? It's done. It's finished. This is already determined. This has already been planned. I am submitting myself humbly underneath the hand of my Father. Not my will be done, but His will be done. And I'm doing that. It is finished. This signifies the accomplishment of salvation for all those who believe. Did you know that when you believe, you enter into Tetelestai? It is finished. There is nothing that you can do to add to this, and there's nothing that you can do to get away from this. It is finished. It's accomplished. There's also this establishment of this new covenant between God and humanity. And as believers, we rest assured like we sang this morning. We rest assured in the finality of as well as the sufficiency of Christ's atoning sacrifice. We find hope in this. We find assurance in this. We find abundant life in His name. This is eternal life. This finished work of Jesus. That's why it's eternal life. It's finished. It's accomplished. It's bought for you. It's paid for in full. You're His and He is yours. It's no longer you that live as a Christian. It is He that now lives in you. It's finished. Doesn't that give you hope? Let's then look at our second section, and that I've entitled Preparation and Fulfillment. Preparation and Fulfillment. Before Jesus spoke the words, it is finished on the cross, He had already accepted the cup of suffering that was prepared for Him by His Father. We saw that in John 18, 11, when Peter attempted to defend the Lord Jesus with a sword. And what does he say? He says, my father's given this cup to me, shall I not drink it? Now this metaphorical idea of the cup, it symbolizes the suffering and the wrath that Jesus willingly accepted on behalf of humanity. No one took Jesus' life from him. He lay it down as a ransom for men. He didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And throughout the whole of the Old Testament, this concept of the cup, I mean, we take part in the cup now. There's the symbolry still that we enjoy by when we take part in the Lord's Supper, which we will do, Lord willing, tomorrow. Wait, we are, we are Friday. What we'll do on Sunday. <laughs> On the Lord's Day. You see, remember, what we do on the Lord's Day, when we meet in the mornings, it is a picture of the fact that Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week in the morning. And then when we get together in the evenings, do you know what we remember then? The early church started its services in the evening. And so our mornings and our evening services are all about the fact that Jesus rose from the dead on the Lord's Day, and the church started on the Lord's Day in the evening of the Lord's Day. And so you miss the morning service, maybe you don't really think it's important that Jesus rose from the dead. You miss the evening service, maybe you don't really think it's important that we have a very rich history of the local church taking the Lord's Day seriously. Just as a side note. But this idea of the cup signifies God's judgment of wrath that is poured out upon sin. This is a massive concept. 
Psalm 75 verse 8, for example, the psalmist speaks of the cup of God's wrath, which the wicked must drink down to its dredges. Our Lord Jesus became sin for us. He took the full cup of the wrath of God with all the sin of the world mixed together, bubbling over in a sense, and right down to the last bitter drops. This imagery shows the severity of God's judgment against sin and also the necessity of atonement. The whole world would not be sufficient enough to receive this cup of the wrath of God. It must be God Himself, the Eternal One, the Holy One, who absorbs and takes the wrath that He Himself has upon sin. This cup of suffering that Jesus accepted was filled with the full measure of God's wrath against sin. Every single sin that you have committed your whole life and still will commit was paid for in full through that drinking of the cup of the wrath of God. It's a cup of divine judgment mixed with the consequences of man's rebellion. A concept that's also reminiscent of even the great flood in Genesis 6. You remember what happened there? I want you to try and imagine this with me and try and picture this because the physical realm can simply not receive enough and fulfill the wrath of God. Because listen to what happens. Genesis 6 verse 5 to 8. And this is a sad section in the history of man. Then Yahweh saw that the evil of man, this is Genesis 6 from verse 5, was great on the earth. And that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's the condition of man. Has anything changed? As you look around you in our world? With the condition of man? Every intent of the thoughts of the heart was only evil continually. What do you think that does with the wrath of God? And Yahweh regretted that He had made man on the earth. And He was grieved in His heart. Just before this, He says, My spirit will not dwell with man forever. By the way, Ephesians picks up on this concept and he says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God that abides with you. This finished work of Jesus that we are in ought to be all the more reason to run this race that is set before us with great joy and vigor and not grieving the Spirit of God because we can do to the Spirit of God as Christians what the people in Noah's day did with the Spirit of God, which was grieve Him. But when it talks about Him being grieved to the heart, Enter into, just in your minds, in imagination, this grief that so grieved God the Father. And then you recognize the grief that so grieved our Lord Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, that His soul was being grieved. Why? As He contemplates the wrath of God. This wrath which our sin has deserved. And Yahweh said, listen to what he says in verse 7, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky, for I regret that I have made them. A very interesting Hebrew word, nachem, for regret. It's this idea of God repenting. God repents over the fact that he made man. That's how sinful man is. That's how wicked man is. That's how much wrath is being stored up because of the sins of man. And praise God, verse 8, but Noah found favor in the eyes of Yahweh. And you remember what happened in Noah's day? The deep broke forth. The clouds broke forth. The, the storms, the, the terror, the whole of humanity is wiped out. Destroyed utterly because of the wrath of God that was kindled against mankind. But how is it possible that even somebody like Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord? It is because of Tetelestai. It is because of something that has been finished from before the foundation of the earth. Because wrath has been drunk to the full by Jesus. Now you think about the devastation of that flood. And then think about one man. 
not simply an ordinary man, fully God, fully man, fully absolving the full wrath of God that, that all of mankind has sinned about since the very beginning. You see, dear ones, the only reason that anybody goes to hell is because they reject that finished work. That's the reason. They reject Jesus. And because they reject Jesus, that is the unforgivable sin that the Father cannot handle. Because the Father is exalting Jesus. And He says to everybody whom He has loved with a love that you cannot imagine. Why? Because He gave all of that cup of His wrath that all of the sins of all of the world was boiling over in. And He made His Son drink it because He loves you and me. It isn't because God hated the world that He killed His Son. He loved the world so He gave His Son. And, and God is all about lifting up His Son. And He says, I'm going to glorify My Son. Look at how great My Son is. He's able to drink this wrath that your sins have filled up to the brim of that cup. And He drank the last drop of it. And guess what happened? He had victory over that because He is My Son. He rose again. This is the glory that God has given us in the gospel. It's something that we take so lightly so often. When we drink of the cup, when we eat of the bread, it is because of this finished work of Jesus. We remember what He has done and we look forward to what He is doing. He is preparing the place for us. There is a marriage feast that is coming. The marriage feast of the Lamb, which if you believe on Jesus Christ as your Lord, you will take part in that. It's as good as finished. It's as good as done. It is as good as tetelestai. Despite the immense agony and the suffering that awaited him, I mean, this is beyond our imagining. Father, if it's your will, let this cup pass from me. That's what Jesus is speaking about. All of this wrath. But yet not my will, but yours be done. I'll do your will, Lord. Jesus was resolute in his determination to fulfill the Father's will. His obedience, even until death, demonstrates this unwavering commitment to accomplishing this task of redemption. Nothing could dissuade him from this. From this mission which already had been fulfilled. Isn't that glorious? Not even the excruciating agony of the cross, which, by the way, he felt every bit of it. And nothing of what they did to his physical body would even compare to the kind of agony that our Lord went through when he drank that cup all the way to the last drop. And while he drinks it, the Father turns his face away. We can't even wrap our minds fully around this. There's not one moment where Jesus was not God. There is still no moment that Jesus is not God. There's not one moment where the triune God has been split. But the smiling face of the providence and the nearness of the Father to His Son, at that moment, His face was turned away and all that Jesus received was the full measure of the wrath of His Father against the sin of the whole world. We can't even begin to comprehend this moment for our Lord Jesus at the cross. The only time in all of Jesus' earthly ministry where He does not say, Father, but He says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In His forsaking of Christ, the finished work is complete. We can't wrap our minds around this. We can't worship enough the greatness of our good God in what He's done in Christ. I can't even explain it to you rightly. I'm trying, trying to get my, my own mind around these concepts which are too big for us to grasp. But dear Christian, this is the faith that we have. This is the God that we serve. This is the Jesus who saved us. This is what we live in. This is life. 
You want to know what eternal life is? It's knowing the Father, knowing the Son. It is entering into this tetelestai. And that's by faith. You don't have this in physical ways. You don't have this with money that you can buy. You don't have this with good deeds that you can do. You don't have this by being some kind of a fancy person or whatever it is. You have this in Him and Him alone. Nothing could dissuade Jesus from this mission. Not even the excruciating agony of the cross. Why, we ask ourselves. Why? You think it's mostly about the glory of God? Yes, that, that happens. God is glorified. Let me tell you something of a grander reason. It's because of the tremendous love of God. The love of God. Which we cannot even begin to fathom. Very rarely will a man give his life for a good guy. But for his enemy? And Christ died for you while you were yet an enemy of God. How much love is that? How much love is that? How much do you think he now loves you since you've come to saving faith? If God would love you that much, when you were a rebel reprobate. Excruciating agony, yet he doesn't turn from it one bit. My father gave me the cup, Peter. I'm going to drink it. Determination. In John 19, 28, which we read earlier, John, uh, Jesus declares his declaration of thirst actually serves as this poignant fulfillment of Scripture and the prophecy of Scripture. That's what we were even told there. He already knew it was finished. Jesus knows this is done. He does some physical things so that you can be alerted to some of the deeper spiritual things. We read about this, we think to ourselves, mixed wine, hyssop on a sponge. What is up with this? Jesus knew this was already done. But in His mercy, He actually does these physical things so that you and I look back at this and we go, there's some physical things that point to a deeper spiritual reality. Psalm 69 verse 21 says, They also gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Even there, when it is finished, he's still finishing what is finished. That's the point. So committed is he. Through this action, Jesus then affirms every Detail of his mission was meticulously fulfilled according to God's plan. Go through the scriptures. If you go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the amount of times, especially the book of Matthew, you'll notice that there. So the scriptures were fulfilled. So the scriptures were fulfilled. So the scriptures were fulfilled. The scriptures were tetelestai in everything that Jesus did. So as Jesus hung on the cross, enduring the full weight of, of humanity's sin and God's judgment, right there, he would even lift himself up in that suffocating position to say things that were in line with the Scriptures. You think about that. How tempted are you when you go through pain to turn on the Lord? Or to no longer do what God would have you do? Not our Lord Jesus. He accomplishes right to the very end. Right to that last drop. His determination was unwavering. His obedience serves as this profound reality for you and for me. That's what we enter into when we're born again. And this urges you and I to yield our wills completely to the Father's plan. Think about this for a moment. Where's my will when it comes to the alignment with God's plans? Am I still holding on to my will? you probably then haven't understood the finished work of Jesus. Because we ought to yield ourselves fully to His will. You are mine, Lord, and I am yours. It is no longer I that live. But can you say that, dear one? Can you say that today, this Good Friday, can you say it's no longer I that live? Or is it all about you until maybe Sunday morning, if you feel like it? Have you taken the finished work of Jesus as a reason for a holiday in the world? Let me tell you, this is our marching orders. 
This is the reason why we ought to get out of bed in the morning. This is the reason that we should serve Him with great vigor, because it is finished. That's the faith that we have as believers. Let's turn to our third section, and that is the implications that it has for believers. And I've already started touching on that. Just as Jesus completed the work of redemption on the cross, you and I, as His followers, are called to walk in the reality of that finished work. Did you hear me? We're called to walk in that. We're not called to stand still. We're not called to lie down. We're not called to relax. We're not called to sit back. We're not called to let go and let God. No. Grab a hold of yourself. That's not a biblical statement. We're called to get busy with the work that He's called us to. Knowing that it is finished. I mean, there's no greater reason for us to march in the battle that the Lord has called us towards than the fact that He already has the victory. I mean, imagine if you were walking and um, you were called to fight this battle so that you would get the victory. Well, that, that would be quite, quite a scary thought, right? Then we'd be operated by fear. Guess, guess what probably would have happened then? This building would probably not be big enough for all the people that are so scared. That come on Good Friday to come and worship because we better accomplish the work. Sadly, some Christians take this as too much liberty <laughs> and they just sit back and everything's done for me. That shouldn't happen that way. That's sadly how people react to this. That's why Romans 6 was written. Uh, grace is abounded, so should we just sin so that grace abounds more? Look, Jesus already finished it. So what are you calling us towards, preacher? That's how some people take this. You best not take it that way. That's a misunderstanding of the finished work of Jesus. But we're not moved by fear. Of course, you should fear the Lord. That's the beginning point of wisdom. But, but we're not here this morning because we're trying to get some brownie points on some big blackboard that God is busy marking off. Oh, I saw that one at Good Friday service. Tick. And that one was there. Tick. You know, we're the ones that do the blackboard stuff with each other. Not God. Christ has finished the work. What are the implications of this? We recognize that it is not through our efforts or good works that we are saved, but through faith in the finished work of Christ at the cross. That's Ephesians 2, 8 to 9, which says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one may boast. None of us boast about this. For all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we are redeemed only in the finished work of Jesus. But what does this do regarding your and my sanctification? We start to then live in the reality of Christ's finished work. And that entails embracing the fullness of salvation through faith in Him. He saved you for today. To walk today in a way that will please Him today. You were never saved by good works, but you have been saved for good works. And when were these good works prepared? Prepared beforehand that you would Walk in them. Isn't that quite a mystery? What's the mystery? It's already done. Tetelestai. So you were saved for this tetelestai. You were saved to enter into the very thing which our Lord Jesus was in. It's finished. It's as good as done. The victory is won. I'm drinking that cup. And he's drunk that cup for you and for me so that you and I can walk today in a way that is pleasing to the Father. So those good works that you now walk in, none of them ever save you. But even those were prepared beforehand that you'd walk through them and walk that way. It kind of blows your mind, doesn't it? We are to be those that rest in His grace that trust in His promises, that actively participate 
in the ongoing work of the kingdom of God. And where is the kingdom of God? The Bible says within you. There's a grand reality that far outshines this world when you're saved in Christ. Philippians 1.6 assures us, it says, For I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. This good work, it's already done. That's the confidence we have. I mean, central to even that concept of yielding ourselves. Look with me at Galatians 5. Galatians 5, verse 16 to 26. Once you see this, you can't unsee it. So I've, um, if you never saw this before, I don't think I, I should apologize, but you know, your, your times in God's Word are going to be different <laughs> when you see this. Because you see it everywhere. The faith that we have, this eternal life that we have, is tetelestai. It's in what Jesus has completed, his finished work. Look at Galatians 5, 16 to 26. And it's, it's something to mark when you see some of the past tense, present tense, future tense in Scripture reading. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. That's your present tense, continuous walk by this. For the flesh sets its desires against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you do not do the things that you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Why? Why would you not be under the law if you're led by the Spirit? Well, because it is finished, you see. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy and drunkenness, carousing and things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Why? Because when you're practicing such things, you're not practicing tetelestai. You're, you're not born again. You don't have this finished work that you're living in. You're instead living in the flesh. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Somebody living like this is living in that finished work of Jesus. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus crucified the flesh. Do you see that? Past tense. Because we enter into this finished work of Jesus. Crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit... Let us also walk in step with the Spirit. Let us not become those with vain glory, challenging one another, envying one another. Can you see the way that this, this past work of Jesus impacts every single aspect of the Christian life? We are to walk by the Spirit. For when we do we will not gratify the desires of the flesh. As we yield to the Spirit's leading, our lives become aligned with God's will. We are part of that finishedness of Jesus. And we experience the fullness and the completeness that come from walking in obedience to Him. Jesus Himself exemplifies this surrendered life because that's what we're calling or that's what we're being called towards as a result of this finished work of Jesus. You're being called today, if you hear nothing else from this message, you're being called by the Spirit of God to surrender. To surrender to this grand reality. It is finished. To surrender to this fully. Sadly, some of you haven't. Why? Because you actually don't trust God. And you think you know better. That's pride. And that can be repented of today. And maybe you go, but I really want to. I want to yield myself, but I just don't know how. Then it's so simple. Then you pray to God and you say, Lord, 
please help me to do this. You do this in me, Lord. Surrender my will to you because I don't know how. Because I want to live in this finished work that you have. Because that's where real joy is. You know, who, can even, who can even come close to taking away the love of God for those that are in Christ Jesus? I mean, the joy that you and I have, even when we face persecutions and when we face difficulties, when we face various trials of different kinds, knowing that even that, in God's mercy, is perfecting us in regard to this finished work of Jesus. Listen to what our Lord Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, Father, if you are willing, remove the cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Luke 22, 42. As believers, we are called to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, and to follow Jesus. That's Matthew 16, 24. Now let me ask you that poignant question to each individual that is here today. Has that happened with you? Has that happened with you? Have you truly done this? Have you resigned yourself to Him? Have you yielded yourself to Him? Or is it actually still you that's living? Maybe you have all of this gospel so much in your head, and you've learned so much of this, and you've been puffed up in this, and you've been reading the Bible, and you've been coming to church, and you've been, but actually it's still you that's living. And you haven't recognized this mystery of the Tetelestai. Come to him then this day. Come to him today. Let the lights come on. You know that saying, lights on but nobody's home? Don't let that be the case either. Let the lights come on and you go, wow. You accept this by faith. It is impossible to please God apart from faith. This is really what saving faith looks like. It embraces this finished work of Jesus. That's when we trust the sufficiency of Christ's finished work. What does that look like? You stop struggling trying to behave as though you get to finish the work that Jesus did. You stop patting yourself on the back going, look at what a good guy I am. I didn't sin today. We find freedom from the striving and from self-effort. And instead, we rest in His love. We know that our salvation is secure and our lives are held in His capable hands. And then we run, church. We run. And it's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. Who gets all of the glory for this? It's God alone. So let's embrace the reality of Christ's finished work. Let's yield our will to Him. And let us walk in the power of the Spirit for His glory and His achievement in His kingdom. Let's embrace the fullness of salvation through faith in Christ's finished work at the cross, rather than striving to earn or maintain it through our efforts. That's just a recipe for frustration. The Christian life, it's not about striving to accomplish what Jesus has already completed, but it is a living in the reality of what He completed. You get it? That's a whole different motivation. You see, now it's as a result of the mercy of God and what He's done for us that we present ourselves to Him. You see, we present ourselves to Him as the sacrifice, a sacrifice that He paid for, that He paid for in full. And we are now living sacrifices, moving sacrifices. Our tongues are for His glory. Our minds are for His glory. Our hands are for His glory. Our feet are for His glory. Not to get from God, but because we already got from God. Big difference in motivation. Oh, the love of God. Absolutely glorious. But let's then look at our fourth and final point, and that is the assurance of faith. What should this do with you? This should, I mean, this should give you steel in the pipes. This gives you great assurance of faith. As we reflect just on that profound declaration, Tetelestai, it is finished, we're reminded of the assurance of faith that comes from believing in Christ and His completed work on the cross. The Gospel of John was written for this specific purpose, and I read it to you in the introduction. 
but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have what? Life in His name. That's what, that's what this faith does. So ask yourself, am I taking part in life in Jesus' name? Or is, or is my existence more aligned with death in my own name? What do, what do you have today? If you're honest with God. Is it death in your own name? Or life in the name of Jesus? Have you believed on Him? So that you too can live? To have life in His name is to partake in the profound reality of redemption bought by Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross. That's why this is Good Friday. It's more than mere existence. And sadly, I think some Christians just exist. And they get to heaven one day and God says, well, come on in, the foundation's there. But he doesn't say to them, well done, my good and faithful servant, because they weren't good, they weren't faithful, and they weren't his servant. They were not good, and they weren't faithful, and they just sought to serve themselves. But they get in by the skin of their teeth because of that finished work of Jesus, but they don't live like that in this world. And you know, that's, that, that pleases Satan. He can't take away your salvation. But you know what he wants you to do as a Christian? He wants you to be useless for the kingdom of Jesus. And he wants you to go through this life not really living. It's not just existing. It is the restoration of our relationship with God. You're meant to walk with God. You're meant to worship God. You're meant to be in unison with his will on this earth. You're meant to be worshipping Him. He is the creator of life. And so when you have life in His name, you worship Him. There's this restoration. Through faith in Jesus Christ, we enter into that fullness of His finished work. No longer living for ourselves, but for Him who died and rose again on our behalf. Now, is there anything worth holding back for this Jesus? Ask yourself that, church. Should we hold back from this Jesus as Benoni Bible Church? Should we just exist as a church? As comfortably as we can in this world? Oof, better not upset anybody too much. You know, just let's exist. We've got our four walls. Let's just you know, let's just keep the lights on. Let's just exist. Is there anything that is worthy of holding back from this Jesus? Nothing. 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 Give your whole life to Him, who gave His whole life for you. I'm often reminded of that little phrase from a Keith Green song, where he says, He gave His life for you at the cross, but you don't even want to get out of bed for Him. How true is that of our human frailty? You're just like, ugh, I don't feel like it. Ugh. As though your feelings are that which are meant to be your God. No, no. We accept by faith what Jesus did for us. And then guess what happens when we do that? Feelings often catch up. You know, they find you there, worshiping God. I don't feel like it. No, no. But feelings come and they go, I'm so grateful that you dragged me here. Thank you. Thank you for dragging me here. I'm so happy that we are. Feelings are fully engaged now. Sometimes you've got to pray until feelings come along. Sometimes you've got to worship till feelings come along. I'm not saying fake it till you make it. No, that's nonsense too. But God doesn't need something fake from you and I. He knows already what's in our hearts. I mean, you might pray some prayer to him that's a foolish prayer that your mouth utters off, but your heart's not there. God's not into that. That's hypocrisy. But what I am saying is by faith, we storm the gates of hell. By faith, we do what Jesus called us to do. 
We have a life that is purchased by His blood, reconciling us to God and empowering us to walk in fellowship once more with Him and with each other. We have by faith such glorious realities. It's absolutely life-changing. And it's a life that's characterized by intimacy with our Heavenly Father. Because Jesus could say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You and I can say, my Father. We brought near. Because the face of God the Father was turned from His Son as He drank that cup of God's wrath, His face is turned towards you in a smiling face of providence. And He says, my child. And you're His child by faith. Isn't that glorious? His face is towards you because of what Jesus did. Is that not motivation to live for His glory? There's triumph in this. What a triumph that was declared on the cross. That culmination of His earthly ministry. I can just imagine it in my head as Jesus pulls Himself up on the cross and cries out, It is finished! Because there's absolute triumph in this. And that work extends far beyond historical event. This is why we're here. That's why we come week after week. That's why we pray on Friday mornings. That's why we pray on Wednesday nights. That's why we come to Bible 45 and our morning service and our evening service. And we do this. We do this with triumphant cries of glory because we await a coming King. And it's finished. This is a reality that reverberates throughout eternity. And you and I enter into this. That's what it's called, or why it's called, eternal life. Eternal life. Now, do you know the Father? Do you know the Son? And you know them by the help of the Holy Spirit. Our assurance does not rest in our own efforts or our accomplishments, but in the finished work of Jesus. Romans 8.31 says, If God is for us, who then can be against us? In Christ, we have this victory over sin and death and nothing in all of the world, nothing in all of the unseen world can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's Romans 8, 38 to 39. What now? What now, church? You and I are ambassadors. What are we ambassadors of? We're ambassadors of Tetelesta. That's what our job is. When you're saved, you enter into this by life, into this finished work, ambassadors of this finished work, entrusted with the message of reconciliation and redemption. What do we even say to the unsaved? We don't say get saved so that God's finished work will happen. No, we say to him get saved because God's already done it and he's having patience on you, dear one. The reason that the rapture hasn't happened yet is because of his love towards those ones that you're told to go and take the gospel to. Because it's already finished. And we're living on borrowed time. The time is coming soon where Christ will return and rapture his bride. And then we will have that great day of trouble. Jacob's trouble. That seven year tribulation. While we take part in the marriage feast of the Lamb. We have something to look forward to. But the world has something not to look forward to. And you know what? In the hearts of men and women that are not saved, they know that. Because his word has been written there. They've been quenching their conscience. All of the heavens declare this glory of our great God. They know it. So guess what happens when you're an ambassador of this finished work? You have such a confidence. Because look at what God's done with you. I mean, really, we're a bunch of saved sinners. Was there anything great in you that would attract God to you? No, it's because of his finished work. So if he could save a bunch of losers like us, and the greatest of all of you, me, how much more could he save others because of his finished work? We have such a bounce in our step. Hebrews 10, 23 says, and encourages us to hold fast this confession of hope without wavering. That's what we have right now, faith and hope. And we have that because of the love of God. His promise is faithful. That's why we hold it with this. So in conclusion, I'm praying that you would embrace Tetelestai. 
that, that going on from here, if some of these things which I've preached this morning made sense that didn't make sense before, that you'd embrace this. That you would from this day forth live like this. Sometimes we get a little bit of cataracts on our eyes. And we need them to be removed so that we can see these realities in God's word. And that we might live by them. That we might see the way that he has, and, and God has given us a savior who has conquered sin and death. What is it that you sometimes spend so much time worrying about? Sin and death, isn't it? Oh, my body's busy dying. I, I sent a passage to our dear brother Hans this morning from 2 Corinthians 4. Though the outer man is perishing, the inner man is being renewed day by day. We are always being handed over to the... These bodies are busy dying. And we live in a world filled with sin. But guess what? Tetelestai. He's done it. He's conquered sin and death. We have one that has given us life. So now live in that life. Live in that life. And that assurance of Christ's finished work then fills us with a boldness and a confidence and an unwavering trust in the unchanging promises of God. May God help us. Amen. Lord, I'm filled with awe in regard to your finished work. And I believe that my brothers and sisters are as well. We're filled with a worship towards you, our great God. Lord, we also want to confess before you that at times we are not as faithful as we ought to be in regard to what you have accomplished for us. Please, would you humble our hearts before you? Would you cause us to be honest with you this morning? Lord, if we've been going our own way, we pray that, that you would stop us in our tracks, that you would refresh for us this view of your grandeur and this glory. And what a mystery this is, Lord. I mean, we, we battle to understand how this could have been finished already, yet you still finished it. And yet there's still something finished to happen in the future. It's just beyond us. This is far greater than what our minds can truly comprehend. But we know, Lord, by faith that we can accept this because this is truth. Your word is truth. And you've given us your word. And by your Holy Spirit, you are quickening us towards this. And there's something glorious when your Holy Spirit works in our hearts and, and works in our own soul, spirit, immaterial part of us and just charges us up. And Lord, we've been charged up by your word this morning, and I pray that we would live to your glory. That all of these mysteries that we have just looked at in brief this morning, with a few minutes together, or an hour together, that you would so work within us, that we are moved towards awe, and wonder, and worship, and that we would indeed be a people that walk with you, Lord. That we would be like a Noah that finds favor, in your eyes, because of this finished work that you have accomplished for us at the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for your love towards us. Thank you, Father, for your love towards us. By this we have known love, that the Father sent his Son to die. And what a glory this is, O oh Lord. Change our minds where we have adopted foolish things or where we have believed foolish things, things that are less than the grandeur of the reality of this completed work, Cause us to be a people that love you. Cause us also, Lord, because of the love that you've had for us, to have this kind of a love be so evident amongst us as a body of believers. That as we live in the light of this finished work, that the world would begin to see more and more that at a place like Benoni Bible Church, that these are Christians because of what Jesus did for them. So we pray, Lord, that we would live in the light of what you've done, that you would help us day by day to put to death the deeds of the flesh and to sow to the Spirit, so that we might have life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.